Uh, thank you all for having me. And it's a pleasure to get to talk with you. And I'm sure there'll be a lot of time for questions and answers where we can talk about specific um, questions that you guys might have about Sudan and South Sudan. This has been a very exciting year for um, in Sudan. Um, last year, I've been going to Sudan over for maybe the last 10 years or so, um, on and off, beginning my research. Um, and, and during that period, we've seen incredible amount of transition and transformation in Sudanese society. When I first went to Sudan in 2008, um, which was before the partition in 2011, which created the new state of South Sudan, you could Sudan, at least in Khartoum, and it's made, and I mostly focus on Northern Sudan, though I can talk a little bit about Southern Sudan. Um, Sudan was still in the throes of what, was, what we often call the al Ghaz movement, or the Islamic Salvation Front, which was the political party that has ruled Sudan, or collection of political parties that have ruled Sudan since the military coup in 1989. And when I first arrived in 2008, one of the first most striking things that I saw was you would see elementary school children wearing fatigues. And this was a shock to my mind, right? Because the, the Islamic Salvation Front was very much an ideological party dedicated to the idea of Islamic revivalism or Islamic renewal. Um, and it, was a, it, was, it saw itself as a kind of anti-colonial movement, but the interpretation was that through a return to Islam, through a, a return to Sharia law, there would be a kind of revival of Sudanese society. And during the 1990s, it fought, what it, it fought, continued to fight the long civil war with South Sudan, which to be fair, was not something that the Islamic regime started, but it continued and it framed it as an Islamic struggle. And that was one of the reasons that you would see, for instance, children wearing military fatigues. The idea was that the whole society needed to be mobilized uh, to resist imperialism and fight the war in South Sudan. And, and you will see that in marked in many different ways. For instance, during the call to prayer, um, people would actually stop in the street and prayers were very coordinated. Or when I would use the archival archives in, in the university, um, you know, we would all, everyone would stop and except for the few of us who weren't Muslim at that time, we would be left basically alone because everything was a very synchronized um, version of Islam. But as I've returned over the next, say, 10 years, this has all changed. Um, and I started to notice the change maybe in 2017, um, women, for instance, began not wearing um, the headscarf as often in public. Prayers are no longer done in this kind of collective coordinated way. I mean, of course, people still go to the mosque. But you know, in the street and in public places and restaurants, this kind of closing had disappeared. And this is after the partition was accepted in, 20, in 2011. And so South Sudan now was a new state. And then last year, I think I even went in August of 2018, um, last year, and, and you could tell that there was a change coming if you've been following the news, there have been a series of uh, what they call bread riots. There's been a lack of medicine. Of course, the regime is still under heavy sanctions from the United States, though the relationship is getting better. But you could tell that something was happening. You could see a kind of um, unrest. People in general society are starting to question some of the foundations of the Islamization project. And there were these questions about whether or not this had been effective. The joke I used to keep hearing was that the Islamists, when they came to power, they sent us to the, mar to the mosque and they went to the market. So there was this constant refrain that there had been a kind of corruption under the name of religion. But still, even in 2018, in August, even though there were bread riots and there was a lack of money in the street, ATMs didn't have money. So I remember I would have this embarrassing thing where you would try to visit professors at the university, but they wouldn't be in their offices and they would come maybe an hour or two hours later and they would tell you, I've been waiting at the bank and I couldn't leave because I couldn't miss my chance to you know, withdraw even Sudanese pounds, let alone dollars from the bank. Um, and so it was a sense of humiliation, I think for many of the, many members of the professional classes. But 
by December, by, it was a surprise that it grew this much, I think. But, I mean, maybe I just wasn't able to see it coming because for 30 years, the military regime had been in power. Um, by December, large scale protests broke out throughout the country. And specifically in what the regime itself had considered to be the heartland of its support, the northern, central northern areas along the Nile that they had always relied on as kind of the ethnic basis of their regime support. Protests started bringing, breaking out in those cities. And they eventually moved to Khartoum, the capital. And between December and April, there was nonstop protests. And we can talk about the slogans and how the protests played out, but essentially there was a demand for the military itself to, um, to remove what they call the corrupt leadership. And you see other slogans, we could talk about some of the other ones, Kulina Darfur, all of us are Darfurians. And we can talk about why that was such an interesting slogan at the time. But basically there was a civil uprising last year in Sudan over five months that brought the military regime of more than 30 years to its knees. And so in some ways right now is a very exciting time in, um, to study Sudan, right? It's, what, it's been had a successful revolution um, to bring down a military dictatorship of more than 30 years. And the revolution of course wasn't painless, um, but over the next several months between April in August, and we'll talk a little bit about the details, there was a series of back and forth negotiations. And in August, a new transitional government has been formed, bringing in respected members from the Sudanese diaspora. And this was a really important strength for their protest movement, that the diaspora, the Sudanese diaspora is incredibly strong. And, they, and they've taken up professional jobs, you know, in Europe and the United States and Asia and the Middle East. And many members of that diaspora were brought home to form the new government. And one of the things we can talk about is the ways in which that new government is sharing power with the military. And so for ideally for 21 months, this transitional government will survive. Um, and then they'll prepare for civilian elections. Unfortunately, I, Sudanese, of course, couldn't predict something like the coronavirus would happen. Um, and they were expecting, I think, significant international aid to come in to help relieve Sudan of its incredible debt load. Right now, Sudan has um, foreign obligations of at least $54 billion. And it's been um, removed because it's in arrears from the IMF and World Bank. So it's not able to borrow from either the IMF or World Bank because of its arrears and defaulting in the early 1990s. And it also faces significant challenges today with the United States government, even though the United States government has, has removed many of its sanctions for the wars in Darfur and South Sudan. Sudan still f is still on the um, state sponsor of terrorists list for its participation in the coal bombing and the, the embassy bombings in the 1990s in Dar es Salaam in Nairobi. And I know many people have probably heard this, that Sudan in the 1990s also harbored Osama bin Laden. Um, there's some debates about what Osama bin Laden was doing in Sudan, but the regime in the 1990s also had Carlos the Jackal, so it was a it was a place that was bringing in many people that could be considered undesirable to the United States or to Western countries as part of what it saw as globalizing a kind of pan-Islamic project. But there's been a lot of progress has been made on these negotiations. So the, United, the Trump administration is continuing with the Obama administration to work with Sudan about relieving sanctions. And the big stipulation for the United States right now is that Sudan now needs to basically um, make an agreement to reach restitution with American citizens who have suffered from um, terrorist attacks in which the Sudanese government was partially responsible. So the United States has reached a, a $300 million agreement to help pay back um, 
victims of the coal bombing. Um, the coal was a U.S. warship off the coast of Yemen, off the coast of Aden. And now there's a beginning of negotiations about how restitution will be paid for the embassy bombings. The Supreme Court, however, just said that Sudan cannot be sheltered from its liability in U.S. courts. And so that could potentially add another $10 billion to Sudan's debt burden. And so these are some of the challenges that the new government is facing, um, particularly whether or not it can bring in international investment and in aid and debt relief um, to, move, to get its economy moving forward. The first picture I have right now is Sudan in the 1960s. Um, Sudan, of course, in the 1960s was the largest country in Africa two-thirds the size of India, um, but with only 12 million people in total population. The population today of Northern Sudan is approximately 40 million people, with another, say, eight to 10 million people in South Sudan. Um, and you can see, I, I like this picture a lot because it shows you the railroad networks. And so these are the networks that were either left by the British colonial state or expanded, expanded by the first developmental state in the first uh, military government in the 1960s in Sudan. And you can see large parts of the country are not accessible by railroads or roads. And eventually the oil networks will follow sort of this infrastructural pattern. Here you get a picture sort of of, of Sudan and South Sudan. So post-2011, you almost feel like it's a sad irony, but many of the conflicts between Sudan and South Sudan have occurred. Uh, you can see Abiyé, the disputed region. This is a region where the border demarcation is unclear. It's kind of a block in the middle. Um, and you can see the pipeline, the red line are the pipelines that go from South Sudan, where the majority of the oil in the two countries is. Um, to the only refineries which are located in, in Port Sudan in the north. I think the first one was built by Shell. And you can see they all moved north, right? So even when South Sudan became independent, 98% of its government revenue come, came from petroleum. And that petroleum to reach market all has to pass through pipelines going to the north. And unfortunately, most of the oil fields are actually sort of along the borderline region. Um, and so it's in this kind of area of dispute that the great mineral wealth, at least in the 90s and early 21st century, were located. And for South Sudan, still, it's great mineral wealth. In 2013, the civil war in South Sudan breaks out. And the precipitating factor is actually a dispute between Sudan and South Sudan over how much money um, the South Sudanese government has to pay the Sudanese government to transport its petroleum. And they couldn't reach an agreement, so South Sudan refuses to export, to produce oil. And this causes an economic crisis in both countries. But South Sudan is almost wholly dependent outside of foreign aid on oil exports. And so in South Sudan, it led to the implosion of the new, of the new government after only two years. Here, you see the iconic image from the revolution of 2019 of April. Uh, and what she's doing is she's, she's wearing an outfit um, that sort of, that returns to this idea of Nubian kings and queens. And this, I think, is an important element for what I was saying. What, what's, what's begun to replace uh, the, Islamic, the Islamist project has been actually a resurgence of Nubian identity in the North. And you've seen, you've seen it through graffiti. So there's also a graffiti artist named Asal Diab. She has some short videos on YouTube and she has an Instagram page where they've been painting particularly images of Nubian queens um, in public. And so it's been a return of female images of uh, women to public life. And here she's pointing out, resurrecting this Nubian queen in this image that you know the Sudanese people have a kind of national unity and national symbolism that um, can be separated from a kind of, from a more austere vision of Islam mm, that the regime, previous regime had pointed out. And 
The other element in the revolution of uh, 2019, the April Revolution, was the return of the labor movement. And so you see the resurrection of a Sudanese Communist Party, which many people had thought had dissolved in the, at the end of the 1960s, early 1970s, in the face of great repression. The Sudanese Communist Party came back, or reemerged in public, but also the Sudanese labor movement. And the backbone of the Sudanese labor movement, and one of the reasons that there's this train here and that people kept shouting slogans saying, we're waiting for the train from Akbara to come, were this, well, because the, it was the railroad workers who had often been the back of the Sudanese labor movement during the colonial period, and again in the early independence movement, and who had been so viciously repressed um, by the Bashir regime after 1989. And so you also see coming into the sit-in, which is massive military grounds in the center of Khartoum. It's actually kind of funny looking because the army has a building that's shaped like a castle. The Air Force has a building that's shaped like a giant airplane. The Navy has a building that looks like a ship, but they're in like the middle of the city. Um, and so you see this, but it's right next to the railroad tracks. And so you see this coming of the train, and that was the symbol, symbol that the labor movement was with the protesters. But today it's become a bit more complicated. The protest movement was very successful, and it was protected in some ways by this man named um, Muhammad Douglo Hamdan, often frequently known as Himati. And this is a picture actually from the New York Times. Uh, Declan Walsh has been writing a number of story, interesting stories about Sudan um, recently, but based out of Cairo, so it's kind of sporadic coverage. But he wrote one of the big profiles about this man. And Himati in Arabic is a joke because Himati and Hamati, um, Hamati means protector. And this man was from, um, he got his career starting out as what in the early 2000s we used to call the Janjaweed. So, you know, the, the Arab militias that are frequently attacked, um, fought in the Darfurian civil war, and what gradually became um, an ethnic war, a racial war between Africans and Arabs, or was framed in many ways that way. He fought for many decades, he fought for almost a decade in Darfur as a militiaman, but as the Sudanese regime has become under more pressure, the Bashir government was forced to formalize his role. So they disbanded the Janjaweed and they created something called um, the Popular Mobilization Forces. Um, and his particular group is called the Rapid Support Forces. So they got these more you know, politically correct names. His forces were deployed in places like Libya during the uprising in Libya. They've coordinated more with um, European states and Gulf states. He would become quite wealthy after the outbreak of the Yemen civil war because his forces were the forces that were sent from Sudan to Yemen to fight um, on the side of Saudi Arabia. Um, he has strong connections to the Gulf states. But until, the, until April, Bashir had always assumed that, you know, as a mere militiaman, um, Hemeti was dependent upon him and was, he called him his personal protector, even against the army. But Hemeti was the crucial force that switched sides during the uprising. And he came out and he said, you know, my forces are Sudanese forces and we are patriots. He might have committed some massacres early on, um, it seems likely, but, you know, at some moment he got, he got the sign that this wasn't going the way that Bashir had hoped, and he switched sides. And he basically said, I'm devoting my forces to protect the protesters. And it was at that moment that we see this transition in which the military gradually came to see that Bashir could no longer stay in power. Kimothy came out and said, you know, I went to Bashir's house and I, you know, with some of the senior military commanders to tell Bashir of how bad the situation was. And Bashir told, supposedly told them in the Maliki school of Islamic jurisprudence, you know, I can kill a third of the protesters. And they said that it was after that that they were like, okay, this guy has lost his mind. 
and he, you know it can't survive. And you saw also many of the children of senior officers were also in the protest movement. And so, you know, there's a, a question of who were these protesters? I mean, they were also, they came from all walks of society, but many of them would be, you know, the kids that we might know even at places like Harvard and stuff like that, the, the students who come into elite universities whose parents might be somehow in the regime or in the business community, their children were also in the protest movement. And so Hemeti actually, you know, found this role and people were afraid that he would directly take power, but he hasn't, he's agreed to sort of share power as one member in what's called the Sovereign Council. And this has made a lot of people very nervous because what, what does it mean to have a senior warlord, essentially, <laughs> militia leader now um, as vice chairman of the Sovereign Council? And it's unclear to what extent he works for the military or if he works for himself but he's become this force in Sudanese politics, who we've also seen now negotiating partially the peace agreement in South Sudan um, in the last year or so, who self-finances, he runs his own gold mines. Gold after partition became the major export for the Sudanese regime. So he has his own gold mines, he sells gold in the Gulf. He has a company that provides security services, which I guess is a nice word for mercenary services abroad. And he's been able to invest his own money in the regime itself. And this is a makeup of the Sovereign Council. So you can see that it's made up of both civilians and military men. So the military men, of course, are in uniforms. The civilians are wearing civilian clothing. The regime has also included Christians in the Sovereign Council. So here we see um, one of the women who's um, who's a Christian woman who has been included in the Sovereign Council. And many of these people are exiled. So many of the civilians were people who had been exiled um, during the last regime. And here is Abdullah Hamduk, um, who had worked for the United Nations, the Economic Commission on Africa, um, was a well-respected uh, person in international organizations who's become the new prime minister. And he has the unenviable task of trying to reorganize the finances of the Sudanese state. So he's done things like say that, you know, the budget for health will go from, um, I think it was 2% during the Bashir regime of GDP of, of the government budget to 20%. But the problem he has is the same problem that you saw faced in places like Egypt before uh, Sisi came to power, that he's not allowed to touch the military budget. It's not clear that the civilians have the right to reshape the security sector budget. And this is an article that I wrote last summer um, uh, trying to talk about what the negotiations that were happening during the period, what they called the June massacre when the military and, and, and Hamati's forces broke up the sit-in and then August when they eventually agreed to negotiate what, what's called the forces of freedom and change. The civilians. And what we were arguing for is that, you know, you saw this really interesting international politics between African Union members and um, African Union states, which were saying that, you know, we couldn't recognize a military takeover of the regime. And Gulf states like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, which were saying, look, we would feel more comfortable if the military takes over and simply replaces Bashir. And it's part of a greater contest for authority and control in, um, in that region. And, and just to think about where Sudan comes from, Sudan you know, has a long history. The modern Sudanese state is sort of the uh, inheritor of an, of an Ottoman Egyptian colonial project from the 19th century when, when the Ottoman Empire and Egypt were trying to compete with what they saw as the coming European expansion there was the idea that the Ottoman, Ottoman Egypt could have an African empire. And it pushed as far down um, as Lake Victoria and Uganda. It never controlled this territory completely, but it was part of this massive expansion that happens in the early part of the 19th century. You can see they took over large parts of what today would be Saudi Arabia as well, parts of Libya. And this, and the Sudanese state, as it was known before partition, 
um, in 2011 was a remainder of that state um, reconstructed through um, the British takeover gradually of Egypt. So it became the Anglo-Egyptian um, condominium. And so it was never an official colony of the British Empire. It was actually run by a private company, an agency in London. But it was dominated by the British, paid for by the Egyptians, and technically part of both countries' um, royal crowns. All right, I guess I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. What we're taking aback when the moonlighting cop who was driving me from the state police, and I tried very gingerly to kind of ask about folks' perceptions of, um, of uh, the government. They said, our best days, the best president we've had was Numeric, who of course was overthrown in 1986 or 87, uh, which, uh, with making no comment very discreetly about any of the Islamist or famed Islamist government since, seemed to be suggested, even if he was in the States, that the best times have been before. Uh, how widespread is there among the movies that the entire three decades since uh, the coup that has been a lost third of the century for the Sudanese people? Is there really nostalgia? For um, what are the social forces that uh, give hope being able to buy? Far away from the guy with the guns, the guys with guns are always pretty confident about being in control. The mayor himself has been a military. No, I think that's a great question. I mean, um, a lot of my colleagues work on countries, say, like Eritrea and Ethiopia. And one of the biggest contrasts I've always found in working in Sudan versus Eritrea and Ethiopia is that everyone in Sudan is kind of like a political analyst, right? And so like, you know, like when you talk to someone, they have a take. Uh, in the university a few years ago with a colleague of mine by a guy who was, um, who was a foreign, who worked in the foreign ministry, right? And, you know, he took us around and he went, brought his daughter and everything. And then at some moment after he, after he made his salat, his prayers, um, he was like, you know, I'm opposed to the government. And you're thinking to yourself, this is a government official, a high-ranking government official who represents, you know, the, the regime uh, at a kind of political level. Um, but this is very common, I found, in Sudan, is that people would take you aside and be like, you know, I don't support these people. Um, it, to the point where sometimes I'm like, okay, everyone is supposedly in the opposition, but they can't all, I mean, Everyone you meet can't really be in the opposition because then who's in the who's in the regime? Um, but I think that was a that's a key feature, a distinctive feature, I think, of the Sudanese system. And even in 2018, you would see the way in which Bashir seemed to know that, right? He would engage on Twitter with uh, with critics. He would engage in social media wars, and he would say things like, "I see you all, you know, complaining." Um, on Twitter, but if you're a real revolutionary, it's, I want to see you in the streets. And this kind of banter would happen on and off, this idea that um, I know none of you really love me, but, but you know, I think there was a way in which the regime, particularly after the 90s, um, came to rely on this idea that you guys might not love me, but you're all corrupted. Um, so, you know, the way that they would deal with a businessman, for instance, maybe they would give you a special deal, right? Like, you know, you're a businessman, you, you don't like the regime. Many of the businessmen had even been tortured by the regime. Um, but they would be like, okay, you're getting a special rate on dollars. Or, you know, we gave you this concession. Or we helped your son uh, go abroad and form an NGO or something like that. You know, there was some way in which they were involving people in in the murky business. Um, but 
but it's very different than in than in either. I mean, Eritrea is a very extreme case. Like in Eritrea, you would find the very even in Sudan, I met with the daughter of a high-ranking Eritrean colonel, and and you could tell she's even afraid in Khartoum, where she's already partially in exile, to say anything bad about the regime. There was this idea that you know the Eritrean state is listening to you all the time, and what you say will be reported back. Um, and you see it's something less severe in Ethiopia, but you see that also in Ethiopia, this idea that you can't complain. But in Sudan, you could, I mean, even members of the regime, right, they write memoir and they're like, you know, the reason it all went bad is because Abdullah led it astray. You know, he was always an idiot. And, you know, that kind of talk is, is much more tolerated, I think, in Sudan than than in um, neighboring countries, at least for what we might call the Sudanese, mm, at least for those who are seen to be like high school and college educated in Sudan, people who are recognized as part of the Sudanese public, one of your rights is the right to kind of complain. Um, Alden, may I ask, what has been your experience uh, you you said that you you go to Sudan regularly, and so what has your been your experience traveling in and out of the country? And um, do you anticipate that you'll continue to um, go there? Yeah, I mean, at first I did I, I started working on Sudan. I did that un, maybe uh, advised or unadvised thing. I sort of picked Sudan at random while I was in graduate school. My advisor. Um, was a was a professor who had been at Princeton for a long time named Robert Tignor, and um, he came in 1960 and he was an Egypt he was an expert on Egypt, and he had written one article about Sudan, and I and I thought to myself I don't want to write about the same place on kind of the similar subject that my advisor had written eight books about, I'll choose like what seems to be this other other country to go to, and so I arrived in Sudan without really knowing very much. Um, and the Sudanese, and I've mostly done my work in Khartoum, so I know less about South Sudan, but the Sudanese have, have been incredibly hospitable, right? I mean, it's a place that I think of Arab countries, Arab African countries to work in is, is actually a bit easier, like, you can get access to the archives, um, you know, I mean, you can meet different professors, you can have relatively free conversations. I mean, of course, these conversations are coded as Jeffrey was saying, right? I mean, there's a strong sense of nostalgia that I think serves as a way of crit criticizing the current regime. Um, but, you know, you can have kind of fairly open conversations. The hardest thing has been to get to Sudan. Um, because of the deterioration in U.S.-Sudanese relations, it can be quite tricky to get a visa to go to Sudan. Um, I mean, you have to have an invitation or you know, you have to have a sponsorship. Though this year for the first time, I was able to show up at the airport um, and, and gain entry. I mean, I had to get a letter of invitation, but I didn't have to like, you know, uh, go through the full process before I arrived. And so there's a hope that the situation is becoming better and that relations will become easier um, getting to Sudan. And in Sudan, for tourism, I don't think Sudan's quite yet ready for tourism, but it's coming. Um, Sudan has much better, um, or at least the Sudanese opinion is that they have much better uh, archeological sites than the more popular archeological sites in Egypt. Where they have thousands of pyramids spread throughout the country. Uh, every time I go, I'm told about these Italian hotels that are ready to be reopened. Um, but of course, one of the things that happened under the end of Namiri was that alcohol was banned in the country. Um, and I was talking to a guy who ran, who was a manager of the Hilton Hotel, and he was like, this was devastating because the alcohol tax was one of you know, our great revenue sources. I, I have a comment. Um, Please. Have you... Have you read a book, or I read a book years ago by Dave Eggers called What is the What? 
Do you know that book about the Sudan? The Sudan? It stayed with me for a long time. It, I've, I had to Google it to remind myself, but uh, that was quite an effective book. No, I mean, I think this is a great book. And I think like, I think, you know, one of the, one of the, um, one of the strange things about going to Sudan is that in many ways, even when Sudan was one country, it felt, it has the feeling of several different countries at the same time. So for instance, when I, when I started going to Sudan, the war in the South had basically ended, but the war in Darfur was, was still going on at a fire, fairly high pace. But when I would talk to people in Khartoum, it was almost like Darfur is another country, right? I mean, very few people had been, and you could fly, but if you were gonna go by road, um, it took almost a week, because after El Obayad, the roads end. So after in the next neighboring state, the roads end, and then after a while, you have to go sort of off road. Um, and so there was this distance that I find, I always found to be kind of strange. There was a very strange civility in Khartoum. So like, you know, like you could bring, like Dar you could go with your friends from Darfur to the houses of like senior officials and everyone would be welcome. But you always knew that there's war was going on. And so that was always hanging in the backdrop. And, and where you would see it the most was in this growth of, of what they call the three cities, so Khartoum, Omdurman, and another city, Khartoum North. There had grown a huge city of shanty towns around the, the main cities, where people were coming constantly from the conflicts in the periphery. But the city itself was relatively demilitarized. So I don't know if, like, you know, even if you go to a city like Delhi, you see these metal detectors and, you know, and there's men with, with guns. In 2008, you didn't really see that in Khartoum. Um, and so it was weird to think that you're in a country at war, but the war is clearly really, I mean, in their minds, the war is really far away. So did the partition actually create more stability or is it just uh, going to be continuing instability? And what do you have in the way of just the people of Sudan and South Sudan, do you have a lot of family members on each side stretching? So is it a natural partition or an unnatural one that probably isn't st stable for the longer term? I mean, with, with one of my colleagues, uh, I'm a, a scholar named Michael Wildemarium, he's Ethiopian. We, me and him, we've been studying the idea of partition and the Horn of Africa, because the Horn actually has a large number of partitions kind of strange for Africa. I mean, we have Ethiopia and Eritrea, you have Sudan, South Sudan, you have the sort of shadow partitions of Somalia. And then depending on what you think, uh, whether or not you think Yemen can be included sort of in this region, you know, you have Yemen being split in two and then coming back and maybe being split again. Um, and so there's something about this region and partitions that that's an interesting research question. Why has that been a solution here where it hasn't been in other parts of the, of the continent um, or as readily in other parts of the continent? But it, the partition was really, I think, a power deal, right? There were two strong parties um, by the beginning of the 21st century, two parties that at least ideologically said they wanted to govern the whole country. So the Southern People's Liberation Movement at that time run by John Garang, you know, who's the American trained um, um, agricultural economist from Iowa, I mean, trained in Iowa, who goes back and says that he wants something called a new Sudan. So he says, I don't want to fight this rebel movement based in the South just, you know, for Southern secessionism. I want to transform Sudan so that it can be a multicultural, multi-religious, um, community. And then you have, at the time before Bashir becomes the sole authority, after 1999, you have a man named um, Hassan al-Turabi, uh, 
who, you know, is the one who's bringing in Osama bin Laden and Carlos the Jackal and who's saying, I don't just want to transform Sudan into an Islamic state, right? I want to remake the Middle East. His whole idea is that he's going to be able to kick the Americans out of the Middle East, uh, teach the Saudis that the real friends aren't places like Egypt, but, you know, places like Sudan, and do this whole, you know, global transformation. Mm. And they both have these big ideas, right? But the war becomes intractable, and, you know, the war goes on for almost 20 something years. And it becomes kind of a stalemate by the early 21st century, by 2005, when they signed the peace treaty. And our theory is that both parties, I mean, John Green is mysteriously killed in a, or mysteriously dies in a plane crash shortly after the peace treaty is signed, and Hassan Tarabi is sidelined. And the military men sort of take over on both sides, both parties. And our theory is that, you know, it's a classic case of military men are like, okay, if we stay in one country, we'll have to share power at least to a certain extent, right? I mean, this is another party that we can't marginalize. We can't defeat them on the battlefield. So what if we create two separate countries? And, and unfortunately, in both cases, this has led to some of the worst tendencies. In the South, Salva Kiir has become kind of a dictator. Um, he was trying to consolidate power around him and his ethnic group. And in the North, Bash Omar al-Bashir was given sort of a free hand to try to consolidate power around um, his political party. But it was never fully um, natural. So many Southerners, they say, I mean, some people estimate I forgot the exact number, but millions of Southerners, for instance, lived in the North. And of course, many Northern businessmen and, I mean, many Northerners also lived in the South. And this raises other questions. For instance, many Southerners actually speak a form of Arabic to each other, right? They call it Juba Arabic. And so you, you could see like Salva Kiir, for instance, he seems more comfortable often speaking Arabic than any other language. And so there's these questions about like, you know, should the South give up Arabic? What does it mean if you're a Muslim in the South? Is, is Islam a foreign religion in the South? And then in the North, you know, should the North be a pluralistic state? Or, you know, now that the South is gone, where it's not really true, but in the imagination, the majority of non-Muslims lived, should the North now be an Islamic state? Does that further justify it? All these questions are there, but lately the things that I've heard the most are this kind of nostalgia. So I've heard young people talk about, you know, our neighbors are gone. And this idea that there's something missing because there was, you know, classic uh, transfer of population of people, millions of people left Khartoum or were sent back, denied citizenship and sent into the South. Um, and so that, I think the tension is still there and you see people talk about the new maps, right? So the, the, the picture of Sudan looks um, atrophied to many people, right? It's the idea that Sudan isn't as big as it should be. Part of our limb was cut off, they'll say. And so I think that's always there. I think partition is really hard, um, at least psychologically. And then of course, they're both dependent on each other. So the new government in South Sudan has actually had to ask the Sudanese army to come back into South Sudan to provide security for the oil wells. And so these countries can't really be separated, right? Sudan buys the food products from South Sudan. So in many ways, it's only a partial separation. 